If you have your Bible, let's go together to the story that is usually read around Christmas time, the story of the wise men. Now as you're going to Matthew chapter 2, I do want to remind you that wise men traveled around 800 miles in this story. It took them around two years. From the time that they saw the star, the people who study this, they tell us that it took them actually about two years. So the time that they arrive in Bethlehem, Jesus is about already two years old. So the idea that wise men came to the manger is actually not scriptural because the Bible says they came to the house, not to the manger. And they didn't come to Nazareth, they came to Bethlehem. And so that we know that they came to already a place where Jesus was living. Now at this time, Bethlehem is a very small town of 1,500 citizens. They only had about 20 children that were tw two, age two and down and half of those children were females, not males. So the massacre that happened in this little town, though it was tragic, it wasn't thousands of kids because there was no thousands of kids present in Bethlehem. It does not make it less tragic nevertheless. So wise men, they come to Jerusalem. They've been following this star and it took them many years because remember, they didn't have airplanes. They didn't have, um, they traveled on probably camels. We don't know for sure. There is no mention there was three of them. We don't know how many of them were there. It could be five, it could be 20. So there was just a group of these scientists, group of these people that study stars. They were not necessarily wise men because they were wise. They were smart. They studied the stars and they probably knew something about the prophecy of Daniel and they did their calculation. They followed this supernatural phenomenal in the sky and they followed this star. It goes, they go to Jerusalem. That's where the religious people are at. They're asking questions about the king that is to be born. And in the verse 2 of Matthew 2, if you are there, let's read together. It says that, where is he who had been born the king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. I want to speak today concerning how worship can bring personal change in our life. While it is important to believe God to change our children, our country, our cities and our environment and we stand for that and God wants to bring change to our surroundings. But God's number one goal I believe before changing anybody is really changing us first. As much as I believe God comes to restore marriages but He first comes to save individuals that are married. Because the problem is not marriage, the problem is the people that are married. <laughs> If people in the marriage will be fixed, the marriage will take care of itself. So the problem is not with the world now, the problem is with the people that live here. It's because if we are fixed, everything else will mostly take care of itself. There still will be evil in the world, but a lot of that evil will be suppressed by the people who are changed. That's why when you're flying, you know, one of the things that they'll tell you is that in the case of cabin pressure, in case cabin pressure changes, the masks will drop and then put on the mask on yourself first and then take care of the passengers. And so even the stewardesses in the airlines know that we need to take care of you first. So Jesus came to save us from our sins. He came to rescue us and to change us first. When it comes to worship, you may say, how does that relate to my personal transformation? How does that affect me personally? I have a few thoughts I want to share with you from this. If you're taking notes, we're not taking church. I want you to write the first thing down. Is that worship is the only thing we give to God that He first didn't give to us. What does that mean? Nothing you offer to God really is yours. For example, if you give Him your life, it's actually His. If you come and you say, Lord, I'm going to give you my youth, my teenage years. The scripture says the times are in His hands. If you give Him your body, He's the one that created us out of the dirt of the ground. If you offer Him your spirit, the Bible says He breathed His Spirit into the body and you became a living soul. If you offer God and you become so generous, you say, Lord, I'm going to give you all of my possessions. The scripture says, all silver and gold is mine. 
So you can't bring anything to God that didn't start with Him giving it to you. Except one thing that God never gave you and that is worship. Because God doesn't share worship. He doesn't give worship to no one. And this is the only gift you can offer to God that God first did not offer to you. I want you to look at these wise men. They came to see Jesus. They have not been fed by Jesus through the multiplication of bread. Lazarus wasn't raised who maybe was their relative. They didn't experience deliverance from evil spirits. They didn't experience healing of physical illness or infirmity. The only thing they've seen is a physical phenomenon in the sky and they follow that phenomenon and I want you to see not out of the curiosity to see the king. They said very clearly our motive and our goal is simple. We want to come to worship the king. It's not enough to just see him, we came to worship him. And I believe that wise men still seek him and wise men still worship him. Any wise men we have in this house? You may not be an astrologist, you might not know about the stars, but you know the one that made them and his name is Jesus. And did you come here to worship him? Come on somebody, drop that in the chat. If you love Jesus, if you come to worship Jesus, give the Lord a clap offering right now. Hallelujah. Now, I want to remind you that wise men didn't come to worship Mary. I'll take it just a small little pause. We love Mary. We just don't worship Mary. Okay. They didn't also come to worship worship. Some of us, we don't worship Mary, but we worship worship. We love our preferences over the presence of God. We love the style of worship more than we love the surrender that worship is supposed to be. I'm guilty of that myself. So I'll volunteer as, a, as the one that struggled with this. While it's easy to point fingers at Catholics and say, you know, you guys really make Mary bigger than, than she is. A lot of us, we like, we like actually the idea of worship more than the, what the worship is supposed to do. And how it's evident because when our favorite song goes in, our hands go up. When it's not his favorite song, usually our hands go in our pocket and we're like, man, I'm waiting for the right tune. I'm waiting for the Spirit to hit me, you know. Because in reality, I'm not here to worship. I'm here to just, I like worship so much instead of what worship represents. So I want to remind you, when wise men came to worship, there was no band in that house. There was no guest singer from the Maverick City. Like we have today, there was no Ryan controlling the lights and making the mood just smooth. There was nobody drumming things. There was no beautiful piano that is playing behind. And there was no LED screen where you can read the words. But what was there is worship. As much as we love singing, as much as we love the sound, as much as we love the lights, worship is not about the songs, it's about your surrender. Worship is not about hymns, it's about Him. Worship is not about preference, it's about your pursuit of His presence. Come on somebody, give God a clap offering right now. Worship Him like you know He deserves to be worshipped. The first mention of word worship in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 22 and Abraham is offering his son and Genesis 22 verse 5 you know we see that Abraham he tells his son let's go yonder and worship. And you would think like awesome who is going to be the singer? What songs are they going to sing? But you don't see a singer you don't see a microphone, you see a knife and an altar. You're like, oh Lord, I don't want to yonder and worship that kind of way. What is worship? Biblically speaking, worship is your obedience to God. It expresses itself in singing, clapping, dancing, shouting. It expresses yourself in bowing. But the heart of worship is obedience to God. So when we're saying right now about worship, I don't necessarily mean that you lift your hands and sing a song. Though that is good and that is very important and we need to grow in that. What I mean by worship is biblical definition of worship. 
When Samaritan woman asked Jesus, where should we worship? Our father said this, you Jews say this. And Jesus says, the time will come where those who worship, he didn't say they will worship with the track. He says they will worship in the spirit and in the truth. And he says the place will matter, your preferences will matter. What will matter is your spirit, meaning your, your heart. What will matter is right here, what's happening right here. Your life being surrendered to God. Personal transformation does not happen without worship. And worship does not happen without surrender. Worship does not happen without obedience. The second thing I want to highlight and that is, let's go to verse 8. And he sent them to Bethlehem. So he in here is Herod saying, go search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring him back, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. The second truth I want to highlight about worship that will relate to our personal transformation. And that is anywhere there is genuine worship, there will always be a counterfeit. I am harassed with DMs on Instagram every single day, at least five. Vlad, do you know you have a fake account? Is this your account? And I'm thinking, as like precious people, if you're messaging me already and you know this person messaged you from Nigeria asking you for my orphanage and gave you my WhatsApp number that starts with a Nigerian area code and you are in doubt and I already posted million times and I'm exaggerating million times not million maybe just few tens of times that I do not ask for donations that it's not me but you know why people make fake accounts of me because I exist and because I am little bit known on Instagram. Anytime you have people that genuinely worship God, the devil will always foster counterfeit. And the world refuses to worship God because they say there are fake Christians. But fake Christians are the proof that there are real Christians. Fake Christians, fake worshipers are the confirmation that there are genuine believers. Genuine worshipers, wise men, caused a fake follow, fake worshipers. In a way that somebody wanted to worship now in pretense. There could be no counterfeit worship if there is no real worship. And so don't be discouraged by somebody not in this church they're not sitting on your row I can assure you they're probably sitting right behind you I'm just kidding they're not in this room probably but there's always going to be a counterfeit anytime you see a real worship so I just want to give you a pastoral encouragement don't be distracted by a counterfeit worship don't be distracted when you come and you know somebody they're faking it or their life is not real don't let them steal your worship you press in if you're the real deal don't let them distract you somebody give God some praise how would you know somebody is not real is it because they're passionate hype and sometimes we're like oh they must be fake because they're too excited that doesn't mean they're fake but I look at Herod and I see a few things. One is that actually he did not want to go to worship. He wanted everybody else to go and do the work for him. I feel like fake worship is people who actually don't want to pursue God. But they're so comfortable being where they're at and they do not want to pursue him. Another thing I want you to notice is that Herod personally was very bad to people. He killed people. Now in that culture, when you're a king, you could kind of do pretty much anything you want, but it still doesn't change the fact that killing people is bad. And some of us were like, man, we don't do that anymore. But you know, some of us have done more damage with our mouth than Herod probably have done with his. Our mouth, our tongue doesn't have bones, but it can break bones. It's very powerful. We can hurt people with our mouth. We can hurt people with our words. 
Abel and Cain is an example of that. One was a genuine worshiper and the other one was a fraud, fake, counterfeit. And one of the signs you know a counterfeit worship is how they treat people after they worship. Abel, we know he was killed by Cain. Cain was a worshiper but he killed his brother. Herod was a worshiper. He says, I will go and worship him and then he ends up killing babies. If you are hurting, abusing, mistreating and dealing with people in the way that doesn't honor Christ, your worship is a counterfeit. Because God does not want us to only worship Him and be nasty. Treat people horrible, lie, cheat, mistreat and be a nightmare in our own home and people can't walk or stand or be around us because we are a ticking bomb. Another part about Herod that I want to highlight that highlights a counter worship is not only that he was really bad with people that were close to him but when he did not get his way that Jesus he pretended to worship he sought to destroy. Counter worship is the one that only worships God until stuff hits the fan. They are the seed in the ground that sprouts but when the sun comes up they scorch and die. Their faith is only alive until a problem happens they can't explain, a prayer is not answered, a sickness is not healed, a breakthrough did not come and then this God that I said tell me more about him, I want to worship him, where is he live because I want to kill him. How many people have renounced their faith? Not because they found something in history or they found something in psychology that disproves the existence of God. It's more that they found something in their own history, in their own life, where they did not get their way. Every person in this room has had things that didn't go your way. Not one person here has had everything go their way. If your idea of God is He's some genie that will make all of your dreams come true, then you're not worshiping Him, you're just using Him as a means to fulfilling your dreams. Now I will tell you right away, God will fail you. Why? Because He is not somebody you use, He's somebody you worship. You will miss the most important part about this life is that it's a warfare. And in warfare there are casualties, there are trials and there are tribulations and God doesn't own you an explanation. Why? Because He owns you. He is the master and the Lord of the universe. I remember when I was confronted with me not getting my way. When I was a teenager, you know, it dawned on me how um, my physical appearance was and I blamed it on God. I mean, you're a teenager, that's what you know what to do. You blame it on somebody. So I felt like God was responsible. Why couldn't He prevent me from being born like normal people? My life now is very challenging because God made a mistake. So I went from worshiping God, not, I didn't renounce Him, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna be very honest with you. I really had a difficult time to reconcile His goodness and what's happening in my life. You may say, so how did you overcome that? Well, I realized God doesn't exist for me. I exist for Him. I realized this life is 70 years and He never promised in this book that everything will go my way. He promised He'll never leave me and He promised that His Son will be the way to Him and that if I follow Him, even if I don't get my way, as long as I am on His way, everything is going to be alright. And no, all of my prayers did not get answered. All of my wishes did not come true. But honestly, God has surprised me beyond my wildest dreams. And so what I want to challenge you today is don't be like Herod. When wise men disappointed him and did not come and he didn't get his way, he went bananas and started killing children. Don't go from, I trust in God, I love God, oh, something bad happened, that's it. I renounce God, I leave God, I can't reconcile how bad things can happen to good people. First of all, it happened once and he volunteered. Bad things don't happen to good people because we're not good people. What we are surprised is how come good things happen to bad people like us. 
but Jesus was good and bad things happened to him because he volunteered to die for me so when we begin to think about our life in the in the, in the lens of the gospel we are grateful for the good things but if you see God as a little thing that you control and you manipulate you honestly will act like Herod you'll worship on Sunday but God forbid things don't go your way on Monday then what happens is you will seek to disown disprove God but it still doesn't change he's still the king the fact that Herod wanted to get rid of Jesus Jesus was still the king and in fact it was Herod that died not Jesus and Jesus still reigns and Jesus rose from the dead amen counter worship God cannot personally fix us if we don't genuinely worship him Herod was a great man in fact history calls him Herod the Great you can google him Herod the Great he was the guy who did a remodel for Jerusalem's temple he was not a Jewish man not necessarily a worship of Jehovah yet generous man I mean imagine Elon Musk donating 10 million dollars to pay for Hungry Gents building not being a Christian but giving us the money I mean that would have been great we would have probably been praying for his salvation and his uh, Twitter and stuff so that's how Herod was he was at that day the guy he rebuilt this uh, Jer Jerusalem's temple remodeled it it was the second temple he took care of the remodel that wasn't his religion he gave a facelift for Jerusalem that's like cleaning up Jerusalem that's that's a Jewish city he built about seven fortresses and one of them is Masada some of you who will ever go to visit Israel I would encourage you to include Masada as part of your visit it's close to the Dead Sea it's incredible humongous beautiful fortress Herod built he built a stadium Herod was a great Herod in the sense that he was building great things but Herod privately was also a great failure he had 10 wives and that's not one of his failures because in that day kings had a lot of wives so that's not what I'm referring to but Herod had issues today he will be diagnosed with a mental mental illness but at that time that was just pretty much part of his personality he killed people whom he didn't like for example he killed his favorite wife because he was he was suspecting that she was trying to overthrow him then he killed her two sons which is his two sons that were supposed to inherit the throne he kills them he killed few of his uncles and few of his cousins few of his cousins he also killed his mother-in-law one time he went for a swim with the high priest in Jericho and they played rough in the pool he strangled him and the priest high priest drowned so when you see right now that Herod giving an order to kill children please understand that was part of his personality that was normal for him in fact around this time so 4 AD or some debate that it's 1 uh, 1 BC or 4 BC so about the time that Jesus was born is when Herod died one of the things that Herod did is that he gathered the most prestige Jewish men most renowned men in Israel he gathered them in Jericho he kept them there as he was dying and gave an order to execute them when he dies so that everyone will mourn for those famous people in this way the history will say everyone mourned for Herod because he knew nobody would mourn his death he was so paranoid he was living in such a big fear that while he had greatness on the outside he had terrible difficult bad mental illness almost borderline like not healthy on the inside and incredible part is that while he was so paranoid so scared he still masked himself with pretense worship I wonder how and what is happening deep inside of every person who pretends to worship how much of that sometimes we actually mask our real problems that are happening on the inside but see this is what happens when you worship for real God begins to take your problems and he brings progress in your life he begins to change your life 
because you can't remain paranoid when you worship God will give you peace instead of paranoia you may come in worried God will give you blessing instead of your worry when you come in insecure God will give you confidence instead of insecurity when you come in burdened with the family problems God will unburden you and give you the joy and give you the peace instead of your burden emotional trauma emotional trauma maybe what was happening to you when you were a child when you come to worship and you strip the fakeness and you say God here I am Lord I want to be real with you and you tell God what happened God will begin to disinfect your wounds and turn your wounds into scars and your scars into stars come on somebody fake worship will only put a cover a band-aid on something that is disinfected I don't know what, who abused him, what happened to him and what demon or generational curse was operating in his life. But I do know that if you walk into the presence of Jesus and you be like wise men and you lay prostrate and you worship him, your life will never be the same. It might take six months, it might take six years, but it will start a process of your personal transformation. God does not want you to be just a great Herod who builds a great house, a great business, a great career and who has a great family but you are a nightmare to live with. God doesn't want that. God doesn't want you to be a person who has a fat bank account but you also have a big depression. God doesn't want you to be a person who simply has a great influence in the community and everybody refers to you by sir or doctor or ma'am but in reality when you go to sleep you can't sleep at night without taking 12 pills. God wants your private life to shine. God wants your personal life to be healthy. God wants you to sleep at night like a baby. God wants you to have a peace of mind. God wants you to have a joy in your life. God wants you to sing in the storm. God wants you, if Paul and Silas were singing in jail, that you will rejoice in your trial and in your tribulation. But to do that, you have to be healthy on the inside. You can't be healthy without His presence. You can't be healthy if you don't worship amen number three worship bends our will so not only worship is what I bring to God that God has not given to me number two is not only when I begin to worship I will experience or I will encounter fake worshipers and in order for me not to encounter these fake worshipers I have to stop being one and my goal is not to change how I treat people first. My goal is to come in full surrender to God as my King, not as just my band-aid, not as a means to an end, but as genuinely worship Him. Something will begin to happen. My heart will begin to change. God will take away the paranoia. God will take away the fear. God will take the anxiety and then you will walk out being different. I want you to see what wise men did when they came into the presence of Jesus. And this is verse 11. And when they had come into the house, see this is what Herod missed. Herod got to the verse 8. I would love to worship him. But verse 11 is where the true worshipers come to. Verse 11 is what happens on Monday morning in your house. Verse 11 is what happens on Tuesday in your private room. And verse 11 is this, when they have come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. I want you to notice now this is a common Jewish thing to do before the kings. Some people still do that in other countries where in front of a royalty dignity you don't just bow you actually fall. That is their way of worshipping deity, worshipping divinity, worshipping supreme sovereign being. So they came and this, think about this, this is not a king sitting, this is a baby lying. Yeah. Kind of awkward, you know, when it's like a baby and you're, you're worshiping. The Bible says they felt that this wasn't like, this wasn't like, no, this is actually falling down. The Bible says is they fell, most likely on their knees and they went and went like this or they lie prostrate before baby Jesus. Can I encourage you to worship even if your understanding and experience of God is in the baby stages? Even if you come into your room and you don't feel the mighty glory, in fact maybe you feel nothing, you can still worship God. 
don't wait for God to zap you with power and for you to go and feel it and get electrocuted and start shining and gold dust and angels swinging in your living room. You can worship even if your measure of God's manifestation is in the young baby. You can still worship in that. But something happens with this is what worship is. Worship is bending your will. Our problem with character is that our will is too stiff. Our problem with character is we are stuck up, stubborn. I say we, I didn't say you. We are like that. And the older you are, the harder it is to bend. We fight over, you know, where we should eat, where we should vacation. You know, should we go to the first service, the second service? And a lot of times it's the clash of wills in relationship. It's the clash of wills in ministry. No, I don't want to do it. You're not going to tell me what to do. Our will is very stiff and very stubborn. See what worship does is worship bends your will. If you don't bend your will in worship, life will break your will in crisis life will crush your will and when you bend your will and you're saying Lord not my but your will be done Lord I'm not here to be cute Lord I feel like I am right and my wife is wrong but God right now this is not about me or my wife I'm here to worship you and Jesus you are my king Jesus you are my royal king I praise you I honor you and as you worship something happens your will becomes flexible so when you come out of that worship experience, you are pliable with your children. You are pliable with your circumstances and you're like a palm tree. You don't stand, you bend. And when you bend during the storm, you won't break during the storm. And when the storm passes, you will go right back up. The Bible says when the storm hit Job's life, Job fell and worshiped. Maybe a storm has hit your life. Maybe your children are not serving God. Maybe your spouse served divorce papers to you. Maybe you just lost a loved one during this holiday. Or maybe you're looking at what's happening with your business and you're noticing you're hemorrhaging and you're bleeding money and you're not sure what to do next. And the last thing you want to do is to waste time praying because you need to be investing time and planning. I want to tell you something. God wants to take control of your life. But you need to surrender your will to God and one of the best way that is done is when you get alone with God and you lie prostrate, not physically but emotionally and you say, God my life belongs to you. I don't know what the future holds. 2022 was rough. I am scared of 2023. But God, I know you're still on the throne. Whether it was during pandemic or whether it's 2022 or 2023. Whether inflation is high or whether my family is crazy. Oh Lord, even I am crazy, but you're on the throne. And I will lie before you, Lord. I will worship you, Lord. I will honor you, Lord. I will praise you, Lord. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I will fear no evil even if I walk through the fire you will be with me even if I walk through the storm you will be with me even if I walk through rejection you will be with me God and I will praise you I will worship you Lord I will honor you Lord I will lay my life at your feet Jesus come on somebody raise your hands right now and just begin to worship him Come on, take next 60 seconds and say, Lord, I worship you in the face of uncertainty, in the face of crisis, in the face of financial famine, in the face of inflation, in the face of uncertainty, in the face of fear, in the face of worry, in the face of doubt, in the face of my own hurt and my own pain. I will worship you in the face of unpaid bills. I will worship you in the faith of in the face of the report from the doctors that I am not getting better. Lord, I will praise you in spite. Lord, I will praise you in the midst. Lord, I will praise you in spite of that storm. Lord, I don't understand. Lord, I have many questions, but my questions will wait. Lord, my why will wait. My worship has to have a way. Oh, we praise you, God. Come on, 30 more seconds. Just lift up those hands right now. Even if it's your first time, just try it. Just try it. You raised your hands against your problem before, but now you can raise it to God and say, Lord, I give you my problem. Lord, I give you my situation. Those of you on Zoom, 
Just lift those hands up right now. This is your way of surrender. This is your way of yielding. This is your way of yielding. Yes, Lord. Bible says and then they opened their treasures verse 11 and they presented him gifts sometimes if you're going through a very challenging season and this year probably has been the most difficult year you've ever encountered you're struggling with sleep you're struggling maybe with children and maybe you're struggling with your finances and maybe your relationships are hanging on a thread or maybe like Herod world on the outside is actually so great but your world on the inside is so empty please stop pretending this won't save you this next season saying I will worship won't get you anywhere but actually worshiping come to God give him your pain I'm not saying just right now I'm saying tomorrow Every day life will deal you a deathly blow. You get into your room and you vent to God. You get on your knees and after you finish whining, after you finish venting, some people say, I don't know how to pray. You know how to complain, you know how to pray. Start with complaining. Tell everything that's on your mind. Pour out your soul. God is not nervous and He's not your therapist. He's better than that. He can handle your problems. And then after you do that, Give me some more microphone. After you do that, begin to, and this is where the transformation happens. It's not only when you give God your pain. It's when you give God your treasure. What is treasure? Treasure is the things that are dear to you right now. Pain is one thing. Treasure is your heart. Treasure is your dreams. Treasure is your business. Treasure as a man is your pride. Treasure is your way. And when you get to the point in worship where God not only has your trash but He has your treasure, God will transform you. Some of us come and we vent our problems but we don't give God our possessions. And for some people, possessions is not the money in the bank account, not the extra car in the driveway. That's not, that's not what I'm referring. It's the, I'm right. It's the, my will. It's what I want. My dreams. My own happiness. Who's going to care for my happiness? Who's going to protect my heart? I'm going to set up boundaries. Nobody's going to hurt me. I'm going to leave this relationship. I'm going to leave this church. I'm going to quit job. Why? Because the world is against me. My poor heart. Everybody's attacking my poor heart. That's your treasure. Your heart is your treasure. When you spend more time defending your heart instead of surrendering, you will never experience true transformation by God. I'm not saying you won't be protected from mean people, but sometimes you can cause more pain to you than your worst enemy. I don't trust me. I don't. So when I come into God's presence, I don't want to protect me from you. I know you can hurt me. But I can hurt me worse than you. So I have to give God my treasure. That means my dreams, my savings, everything I have is safer under the shadow of His wings. They're under my own grip and control. And that's called surrender. And that's called yielding. Give Him your treasure. For some people that treasure is your savings account. For some people that treasure is your child. You give God your treasure. That doesn't mean you get rid of your child. It simply means you let go of the control and you say, Lord, this child is yours. And you will start, start sleeping because you're not sleeping every night. You're worried about your child. You're not God. Your child doesn't respond to your calls anymore. 
God can still get their number. Give God your child. Oh, Vlad, my spouse left me. They're not calling me. Hiring a private investigator won't solve that. But if you go into your private place and you say, God, I surrender my spouse to you. Lord, this is my treasure. The, this, this imaginary, incredible dream that I had, that we will grow all together. And I see that this is, this is slipping through my fingers and God, I give you this dream right now. I give you my future right now. Something will happen. God is better at taking care of it. You know what's going to happen last? The Bible says when they gave their treasures, they go to sleep. And that night, God gave them direction. There are people in this room, you're waiting for direction from God right now. What do I do? Who do I marry? Why do I keep failing in relationships? Why do I keep failing? What do I do? Lord, I need to know what to do. You have a counselor. You pay a specialist to guide you. Nothing wrong with that. But there is a place that you reach in God. Where even if you're not wise naturally and you surrender where during the night or during the day God providentially will guide your steps the Bible says and in the night the Lord warned wise men this was above their education this was above their smartness and their cleverness God wants to guide you in 2023 God wants to guide your business in 2023. God wants to guide your family in 2023. God wants to guide your personal happiness in 2023. He wants to protect you from Herod's. He wants to guide you to your place. But I want to warn you today. Don't take personal guidance into your own hands. Let it be in God's hands. Let Him guide you as you worship. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed this content and this was a blessing to you, would you help us? and hit thumbs up so that it could help more people to discover this video. It costs you nothing but it can go a long way to help with the algorithm. As well as if you're not subscribed to our channel, hit subscribe, click on the bell so that you can be reminded each time that we upload videos. Thank you so much for being a part of this community. If you're interested in learning more about Hungry Gen, our internship, our conferences, deliverance and so many other things, go to HungryGen.com for more information. And as always, remember, Better is not good enough, the best is yet to come.